Thank you all for coming back for round three of our uh, introduction to birding workshop um, hosted by Taos Land Trust, Robert Templeton, and, um, and with the help of Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology. Um, so my name is Jim O'Donnell and I'm with the Taos Land Trust. And um, I, I wanted to make sure that you all know up front that I've been recording these sessions and they are available on our website and on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and review those or, or look them over, anything like that. Um, while we are doing this today, um, if you have any questions, I'd like you to- I'll take this one. Yeah, I'll take this one. It's the audio one? Yeah. One, 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 one request is, is if everybody could turn off, could mute yourselves. If you could all mute yourselves, please, that'd be great. Just helps with the quality of the recording. Um, if you do have any questions, send me a chat message and, um, and then we'll, we'll round up the questions every, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to, to, to throw at Robert. Um, so just, just message me and I'll, I'll go through those. And, um, one of the things we're doing with this project is we are, um, seeking to develop several. Uh, bird monitoring groups that will take on individual pieces of land that we are um, uh, working. We're, we're, the, the aim is that we would uh, do habitat restoration on these pieces of land. Um, this is, these are lands where we have uh, conservation easements. And so the, um, the ultimate goal over the next couple of years is to gather date, date line, uh, sorry, baseline data and then um, do some of the restoration work and continue to monitor through that and after that to, um, um, to look at the impacts of the restoration work. So if you are um, uh, interested in that, please send a chat, please send your name and contact information to Maya Anthony in, the, in her chat. And um, We'll get you guys entered in the database and then we'll be in touch uh, later in the month or early in March. So um, if, uh, if anybody has any questions right up front, uh, please, please hit me with those questions and then we'll get going. All right, well, we'll leave it at that and um, I'll turn it over to Robert. Okay, thank you, Jim. Nice to see everybody again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I wanted to get a show of hands here before we start this segment of how many of you, if you have an eBird account and have entered an eBird checklist, would you raise your hand and just keep it up while I scan through everybody? Of course, I can't see the people. I'm getting a thumbs up there. Okay, so mostly I think we're dealing with people who have not done an eBird checklist. So that'll, that, that will help me to know how to, to gauge, to gear this. Okay, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, if you are interested in going on bird walks, many of the people on this Zoom, I have a list of about 35 birders in Dixon, and I have a list of about 35 birders in Taos that have been on bird walks at one time or another. And uh, if you're not on my list, you can get on that list. And what you have to do is send an email. And uh, when we, when I share my screen in a minute ago, in a minute, I'll show you exactly where the address is. And also, if some of you might be interested in some smaller Zooms with uh, just a, you know, maybe it's some little mini workshops here and there to retouch some of the things we've looked at and uh, go over, we can do that. And then keep in mind, if you let me know about bird walks, the, we have the, the thing happening with the monitoring through the Taos Land Trust, but we also can do public bird walks and maybe they'll have to be small group bird walks, but we have a lot of birders that are capable of leading walks and willing to do so. 
And so um, if you're interested, you can do that. Maybe I'll share my screen and show you how to get to that email. Okay, let's see. If you go to, um, where are we here? Sorry guys, just real quick, I wanna jump in. Sorry, Robert. Um, Maya okay. Anthony said that she's having some technical difficulties. So if you're interested in um, working with us on these uh, monitoring crews, how about you just send your information to me in, in a chat and I'll, I'll gather that up today. Yeah, and you could, you could also uh, send that to me at this email too, and I can forward it over. So the email is found in the about this site section. Is everybody seeing this? You're seeing this, right? Jim, you're seeing this? Yes. Yes, thank you. Sorry, looks good. I forgot to press on mute. So down here on the about this web tool, says, if you have questions or comments, please contact Robert Templeton at RT at realmoodlebirds.org. So if you wanna email me there with uh, questions about the website, or if you wanna be included on future bird walks, please feel free to do that. Um, also, just in case, if you lose all your other ways to link in before next week, uh, if you go to realmoodlebirds.org, up at the top of that website, you'll have all the links that you need to get into all of this. So um, I think I think we can just get going. So I'm gonna go down here to ebird.org, Cornell Lab of Ornithology suite of bird watching tools. And it's an incredible suite of tools. It's an incredible number of things that you can do. And it's a, it's a two-way street. There's output, some, in, some wonderful graphics. And if you are get very interested and want to do a little more detailed work, you can download as much of the eBird data as you would like. Uh, that can become a little overwhelming pretty quickly, but it's there, it's available. So oh, you can always go to this page. You saw how I got there. I went to ebird.org on the web tool and there is quick links to the tools. <clears throat> and this will take you to just about everything you need on eBird. And before you do that, you might want to click up there to see a three minute introductory video about eBird. And uh, I'll leave that for you to do on your own, but uh, eBird is an incredible thing. There are, they're, they're approaching now a million checklists that have been filed by birders from around the world. And we'll, we'll see what that means and, and how, what a checklist is, how you can make a checklist and how you can as a citizen participate in the whole scientific endeavor of trying to understand how birds are moving around the landscape, which is a very important question when we get into talking about conservation next week. So let's go back for a moment here. So we're gonna look at first off today, abundance maps, range maps, and abundance animations. So we're gonna start by looking at some of the outputs that you can receive from eBird. Most, some of all of these right here, you can, you can receive without getting an account. Uh, when you wanna go further into it, if you want to uh, put your, your observations online, or if you wanna see uh, certain parts of certain maps, you will have to get a free account. It's a free account, you sign up for it, and then you can enter your own bird data and do everything on the site. So right now, I'm gonna follow my instructions here for abundance maps, range maps, and abundance animations. Go to science and then eBird status and trends. So I chose not to just put the links here 
But to get you into using eBird, so you go to eBird. We're gonna to go to science. See, we'll come back later and submit and we'll look at explore. You won't have my eBird until you have an account. And we're gonna to go to science. And in science, this is where you get into all the, the detailed data. And it's, it's a massive database, but it's available to any scientist, any citizen, it's all available. It's quite incredible. But what I wanna look at right now is the eBird status and trends. This is where they've taken that data and created these really wonderful uh, tools that you can use. So we'll click on eBird status and trends and we will enter, uh, I'm gonna enter Western Tanager, but I'm gonna use a four letter code for Western Tanager made up of the first two letters of, the, of Western and the first two letters of Tanager. So I'm gonna put in WETA and it's gonna say, oh, you must mean Western Tanager. And we'll go to the page, the products page for the Western Tanager. And you'll see there's an abundance map here. There's a range map here and there's abundance animation here. So these are wonderful detailed maps. Here's the, let's go first to the range map. Here's the range map. And it, it, we've, we've looked at this bird before a little bit in previous sessions. So we know in the red, this is where it's breeding. So what we're seeing is that it's breeding up in the mountains, but not in the lowlands. That's where it's migrating through. And we see that it's quite extensive in the winter all around Mexico. If you go look on at the, the traditional uh, range maps that are shown on the web tool, you'll see that it, it makes it look like all the birds are right down there. Well, in 2007, the scientists that worked on those range maps didn't have any data to speak of from this area but now they do. So you get this incredibly detailed range map. The abundance map is even more detailed because it is giving you things in, it's breaking the, it's breaking down some of the style where it's breeding, you see where it's migrating and you see where it is in the winter. And for some species, this is, a uh, very different map because it shows the pre-breeding migratory season in green. And so you see how the birds may take a path up this coast and then come down in the middle. We saw that the other, other day when we were looking at the Rufus hummingbird. And then the third product, of course, if you have this information, then you, you know where these birds are being reported every day. So it's not too much of a leap to jump to the abundance animation, which are these wonderful, I'll just play this one. So where you see we're in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. And just like in real life, it plays out again the next year. So these Western tanagers are making these journeys every year. That in itself is quite outstandingly interesting. You can stop this thing. You can answer the question like, well, when are they gonna get to Taos? Well, looks like they're gonna get around the first week in May. So you can expect to see Western tanagers arriving around the first week of May. And so forth. And when are you going to see your last tanager of the season? Well, looks like you, if you're really observant and out there every day, maybe you'll see one in October, but maybe not. So those are, those are some really wonderful tools and you, you can learn a lot about what's going on with these species. You can also go back to science. We'll go, let me just 
You can always go to the top of the page, go to science, go to eBird status and trends. Did I not click? I didn't. And you can go to explore all status and trends species. And when you do that, you will get this wonderful page, which will show you pictures of the birds in all the families. And you can click on those birds to get to that page in the same way. It's another wonderful tool that comes out of, of all this data. So, uh, <clears throat> Let's jump over to explore. And then after we look at explore, a couple of things, we'll take some questions. So we'll go to explore. You can explore species. You can explore regions. If you're gonna go, if you're taking a trip to see your cousin someplace, you can enter that place in there and, and get a, information about the birds that are in that region. One of the most useful things I found are the bar charts. And uh, we've, there is a tutorial in the, uh, in, our, in the web tool eBird page about how to generate bar charts. If you wanna get one for uh, the Rio Fernando wetlands, I'll just do it here. This just takes a second, why not? We'll do New Mexico and we'll choose hotspots in New Mexico, say continue. Then we get this long list of hotspots and we happen to know that we're dealing with the Rio Fernando wetlands. So we're gonna go down here and we're gonna the Rio Fernando wetlands, Fred, Fred Baca Park and adjacent Rio Fernando Park. We'll select that and we'll go continue and we get this list, which is particular to the Rio Fernando wetlands. And of course it has these abundance bar charts, which tell you, oh, this bird's only here during the summer months from April through September. This bird is here longer through March through into November. Here's an all year round bird, the red-tailed hawk and so forth. For the moment, I just want to point out one thing about this. Well, two things. One, if you, let's choose Cooper's Hawk. If you click on the name on that page, it takes you to this page. It's kind of a portal to some basic information about the birds, some photos, some identification things, some recordings. It takes you to a range map that shows in purple where that bird is seen. It takes you to photos, sound recordings, and videos, all of which you can download from the Macaulay Library at Cornell Labs for your own use. You can download those. And it will give you a direct link to the incredible uh, online field guide all about birds, and it will take you directly to the Cooper's Hawk page on that. So it's a, it's a wonderful portal that you can use. The another aspect that is very useful is this little symbol here, which is a map symbol. So I can click, let, let's stick with the uh, Western Tanager. Uh, here we go. I'll click on the map of the Western Tanager. And we get to a map takes us to a map of the Taos area. And this is, the, this is the critical thing to understand about eBird. Every one of these places is a location. And this is the location, this is the hot spot of Rio Fernando wetlands. And these are all checklists that were filed. There's Tom, Tom Jackman, Bob D'Antonio, Bob Fredericks, Braden Ferris, 
You will know some of these names, many more names. These are all the checklists that have been filed, some of them from historical data, ranging from 1900 up to the present. So what does one of these checklists look like? Well, let's look at one of them. Let's just choose, choose Tom Jackman's here. I'm gonna not choose this one. I'm gonna go back and choose a different one. I'm gonna choose, I'll choose this one. So here's Bob Fredericks, who's also a great bird photographer. He saw one mallard, two Eurasian collared doves, Rufus hummingbird, Calliope hummingbird, so forth and so on. That was the list he saw, uh, Northern water thrush. That's a, not one you get to see every day. The Gill of Ray's warbler. So this is a list of the birds that he saw during a one hour, 17 minute visit to the Rio Fernando wetlands on the 31st of August of 2020. So this was last August. So this is the checklist. This is the heart of eBird. If you put data into eBird, that data goes into that massive database it allows you to see what's being seen where you are, and it provides the material, the raw data for creating all of those incredible products. So let me just stop sharing for a minute, see if we've got any questions at this point. Even if you don't participate in putting data into eBird, you will, find it to be a very, very useful tool at any rate. And of course, after you use it enough, after a while, you may be overcome by the feeling of, hmm, maybe I should be helping this effort out. <laughs> and uh, I think probably the leading uh, eBirder in Taos is Ann Ellen uh, to me. And she has thousands of checklists. I think I saw the number the other day, 3,417 checklists that wow. she has entered. Just, I think that's, that's just in Taos County, something like that. So it's a possibility. Any, any questions at this point? Let's see. Um, Judy is wondering if um, novices, should novices enter data? We will talk about that. Uh, the answer from Cornell Lab of Ornithology is yes. Novices should enter data, but there are some protocols to be followed. And there's a big piece of the protocol which says <laughs> the end, you can select, you punch a button and it says, I am submitting a checklist of all the birds that I was able to identify. It doesn't say all the birds that you saw, but all the birds that you were able to identify. It means you're not ignoring all the starlings or you're not ignoring the robins or, or something like that. You're not, you're not ignoring the crows. You're reporting every species that you could identify. So right there, if you're a novice birder and you go out birding and you see seven species that you can identify and two that you can't, you can enter the seven that you can. And it, it, and it becomes a complete checklist and a complete checklist is what makes the data work. If you don't have a complete checklist, it's very hard for the mathematicians at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and believe me, they've got a high powered group of them there. They are able then to sort out these checklists and come up with some valid extrapolations of what birds are where. So we'll talk more about that because we're going to enter a checklist in a minute. Any other questions? All right, I think we're good to go then. All right. Well, <clears throat> next week we will look in more detail at that map and ways it can be used because there's some interesting things you can do. But for right now, we're gonna answer the question that was on the uh, outline for today of where 
does the data come from from these products? And of course, the answer is it comes from these checklists. So let's make a checklist. I'll share my screen again. And we will go over to submit. Now we, you'll see here if I move this for a minute, we are in my account. And so you'll have to have an account before you can submit a checklist, but we're gonna submit a checklist. And the first thing it's gonna ask is where were you birding? And the checklist we're gonna enter is a checklist that I made this morning in a 10 minute walk down my driveway. And so I'm gonna select from, all that, from the locations that I already have established. You can also find it on a map. You could enter Taos here and you would get a map and you could pinpoint it. You could use latitude and longitude. You could use an entire city, county, state or country. However, it's better to use the most precise ones that you can up to a limit. I, I was not in Baton Park in Albuquerque today, but I was in New Mexico, in Rio Riva County, in Dixon. Now, I could choose a more exact location, but I do a lot of birding on people's private property, and I don't feel like I can list exact locations for many of those sightings. So I use a generalized sighting for areas that they're, they're all within about a mile of where I live. So I've chosen my location. It's not too difficult. And now it's gonna ask me the date. And that's not too difficult either. It's February 8th. Now it's gonna ask me, is this traveling, stationary, historical, or incidental? Okay, let's, let's start at the bottom. Incidental. That would be you're just out hammering nails in your yard and an incredibly rare bird like a Mississippi kite flies over and you've got to report it. Or recently I reported a flock of 65 pignon jays and I did it under incidental. The data is not as valuable. What they would like for you to do is take five minutes and make it into a stationary count. But if you can't do that, then you record it as incidental. It's worth something to do them. Historical is for people who have lists from their past. I could spend the rest of my days entering historical data and someday maybe I will do that. Stationary is you're at a fixed location. This is more like a feeder watch. And this one, there's some protocol for this. If you do a stationary count, it means you're not gonna go more than 30 meters away from where you started the count. And it also means that you're not gonna just add in new birds. Let's say, let's say it is a feeder count. Let's say you're just outside looking at your feeder and there's six house finches at your feeder. And then five minutes later, there's eight house finches. You don't add up the six and the eight to make 14 you replace the six with the eight, the most of any one species that you see at a time. All of this is laid out in the, if we go back to the quick links here real quick, there is a eBird tutorial that will help all of this. Where did you bird? When and how did you go birding? And then so forth. It's, it's really, it's not that difficult. Once you've got the birds identified, entering the birds list is, is not, it's not that difficult of an item. So now we're back at location. Let's see if I can find, here we are. Okay. So this was a traveling count this morning. I walked 0.1 miles down to my gate and 0.1 miles back. Now you don't record the distance there and back, you just record the one-way distance. And on your way back, you don't add birds that you'd already seen unless you see more. For instance, on the way back today, I saw two 
robins that I know that weren't the robins I saw on the way down. And because I, I had them all, I knew where they all four were. So I increased the number from two to four. So the distance that I traveled was 0.1 mile. I started the walk at 8, 23. And the duration was 10 minutes. I didn't want to make too long of a list. <clears throat> and the party size was one. So now I could add comments and I will add a comment on this, which is my comments are private. So I'm gonna put this, this is EB, which means that it's in El Bosque and I know it's right on my property. It's a little internal code there. So now I'll go, you can choose whether to make your comments public or private. So I continue and it likes everything we've done so far. And now I'm ready to start entering data. So now I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna use these four letter codes. I don't have to. The first, the first item on my list <clears throat> is an American crow. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for just a minute. I'll show you what my list looks like. Can you see that? Can you read it? There's my list. It's a list of four letter codes with the number of individuals cited, I'll be cited. Up at the top, it says 2021-0208 for the date. And then it has the time 0823 and the end time 0833. That's, that's my bird list for the day. Now, I can do that in cold weather with my gloves on. I've gotten very adept at holding my list and my pencil and I can keep birding. So I spend very little time recording the birds. I just write down that four letter code and I can write down that four letter code while I still got my eyes up here. It doesn't take much. And if I make a mistake with my four letter code, that's yeah, no big deal to figure out what I was doing. Okay, now let me share my screen again. All right, we're ready to start entering birds. The first one was the American crow. I could spell it out, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use the four letter code, am crow, an American crow, and it gives me an American crow. It's going to shoot me right over there, and I'm going to put in a two. And then I'm going to go to house finch, and it's going to shoot me over there, and I'm going to put in three. And then I'm going to jump over to Moach, what's a moach? A mountain chickadee. And I'm gonna put in the one that I saw. And then I'm gonna go to towns and solitaire. And this time I'm just gonna scroll down cause I know it's not very far to the towns and solitaire. One, I didn't see this bird, I only heard it. And then I'm going to go on down to the dark eyed junco. There were four of them around on the ground. I could tell they were juncos easily because they, when they flew around, I could see the white on the sides of their tail. And in the winter, in our location, it's a dark eyed junco. And I can run right back up to the American robin because that's right by the towns in solitaire. And there were four of them. And the, well, we'll go back so you can see some more codes. E U S T, European Starling. And it's going to allow me to enter the two there. And just a few more to go. A Noffle. Birders use these four letter codes. A Northern Flicker. I saw one. I actually only heard, I didn't see it, I heard it. Spotted toy. Again, I did not see this bird. I heard it's doing its little 
if you go back to the original lecture and go to identifying bird, no, go to observing and go to listening, you'll find that song, list, that sound listed there, that contact call. Spotted toy, one of those. Uh, Eurasian collared dove. One of those flew over just as I was leaving to turn around back home. And on the way back home, I hadn't heard them on the way down, but I did hear them on the way, or I saw them. I saw one and heard one, black-billed magpie, two of them. So that's the list. So we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 species. And I come down to that all important question. Are you submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify? And the answer is yes. I didn't leave out any birds that I identified. And that is the key to why a novice can participate. You only have to, to guarantee that any bird you identified, you're listing it. That's it. So I say yes, and I submit. And now here's this list, Monday, February 8, 2021, one person, 10 minutes, 0.1 miles. It was in Rio Reba County in Dixon, and there is the list. Now, if I had taken some pictures, I could go back over here to add media, and I could add me to them. Uh, add media, and I can I can upload up to ten files per species. I didn't take any pictures, so I'm going to leave that. I'm done with that. But I'm going to show you a couple of other things. Let's say I'm going to go back and edit the species. So this is if I'm all the way back, and now I'm going to I'm going to add in there. Oh yeah, I forgot. I saw a Western tanager. Hmm, no matches on this checklist. That is telling me that maybe I didn't see a Western tanager, because in fact, we know that Western tanager is not here now. Oh, well, maybe it was a Cassin's kingbird. No matches on the list. Well, I'm pretty sure it was a Cassin's kingbird. I'm going to add the species. And I'm going to add Cassin's kingbird. And they're going to let me add the species, but they're going to say, this bird is rare for this date and location. Please add comments, check complete, and add any photos or sounds after submitting and checking and saving the checklist. Now, I might add on there, look, I'm the world's greatest birder, and I saw what I saw. That is not going to help. People, we've been through that thing on the Christmas bird count. What they want to know is exactly what they what you saw. What made you think this was a Cassin's kingbird? And so forth. So there's another help on how, how it helps novices to not enter things that shouldn't be there. So I'm going to give this one up. I'm going to cancel this. I guess I don't know what I saw. Well, I know what I saw because I'm making it up. I know I didn't see anything, but you get the point. So let's uh, let's see if there's any questions now. I'll stop sharing. What about questions? You know, this might be a fairly well-behaved group. You could maybe just unmute and ask a question. Let's see. Let's see what happens. We've got one. Um, if one is monitoring a feeder and there are juncos flitting about. How does one accurately count them without counting the same ones more than once? Okay, so if when you're at a feeder, when you're in a feeder, it's very simple. You count as many as you can see at that moment. It doesn't matter what happens. If you count 14 juncos, later you count six, later you count eight, later you count two, later you count 14. The number is still 14 for that time period. Because if you're doing a stationary count, you're gonna be 
uh, giving an amount of time that you were watching. Now, if you look again and you go, oh, there's 16, okay. Now you change the 14 to 16. You can, you, you must not enter more, you can't just keep adding them up. You can't add 16, then four, then eight, so forth. Any other questions? Let's see. Must one count faster than a bird can fly? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If you just start doing this, you'll figure it out. You know, uh, try, try, just keep it simple. Do 10 minutes and you'll find out, oh, that's a problem. Oh, I see, uh, I can do that. And because, you know, people go on, on Christmas bird counts, complete novices go on Christmas bird counts. And sometimes things are happening fast and furious, but you just get better and better at sorting it out. And sometimes you can't identify the bird. In fact, unless does anybody have another question, we'll, we'll follow that thought, if not. Yeah, we're run, gonna, run with it. We're gonna talk about spuzz and slashes, okay? You've probably never heard of spuzz and slashes, but you're about to, because it's another way that you can deal with not being able to identify a bird completely. So what we're gonna do is go to identifying birds, where we went down to who, and we're gonna go down to spuzz and slashes. Sometimes it's just not possible to identify a bird at the species level. This happens for all levels of birders. It happens all the time for all birders. However, in many cases, it's still possible to get it down to the family level or to the genus level. And I say here, if you're keeping records for yourself, these ID problems, in quotes, can be a great source of learning. And if you're entering your eBird observations, uh, eBird encourages you to use spuzz and slashes. Okay, what are spuzz and slashes? Spuzz are, okay, I know that it was a hawk, but I don't have a clue as to which hawk it was. Okay, enter it on the list as a hawk spa, a hawk species. It will come up. You, you, if, you, if you type in hawk space SP period, it will come up and it'll give you a chance to enter that bird under that data. So instead of, of not entering anything under that uh, so in, instead of that bird going undetected, it's detected at that species level. It's another simplification for novice birders. Now, there is another particular case that comes up often in the hawk world, which is the occipiter species, the sharp shinned or Cooper's hawk. Now let's, let's just take one minute to drop over here We'll go to the bird list and we'll generate a bird list. We'll just generate all the birds and we'll go down to the hawks. And we see that there are these two sharp shinned and Cooper's hawk. And they're in the same genus, the occipiter genus. And there's, you can read about genus on this page that I'm on right now. And the interesting thing about these birds, if we go to the pictures of them, they are really difficult to tell apart. They are in many respects, almost identical. I, I, I was talking to a guy once, to a, a international uh, bird guide in Mexico, and he said he had witnessed in a bird banding site where they had expert birders and they knew which species was which because they had just banded them. 
the experts got 50% right in distinguishing between sharp shinned and Cooper's hawk. It's a very difficult identification problem. So how do you deal with that? Here's how you deal with it. Here I say, even among experienced birders, it can be disagreement as to which species are being observed. Unless you happen to get just the right view in just the right glide or just the right view of the tail, and even there there's overlaps, you may not be able to tell which you saw. This is the important point. It's not a guessing game. If you're not sure about an ID, the responsible thing is to report the individual as either a spa or a slash. So in this case, this bird, I say here, it could be identified as an, as a, as an occipiter spa, because there are three occipiters in our area. However, that third species is really rare at Rio Fernando. It's generally a high altitude birder, and it's distinctively different from the Coopers and Sharpshin. So you're probably not going to confuse it. So at the Rio Fernando wetlands, usually the best option will be to record the individual as Sharpshin slash Cooper's Hawk. If you go to enter a species, it'll give you that option. Here's another one that you might not think about, black cap chickadee and mountain chickadee. Now, visually, no problem. The black cap chickadee has that complete black cheek, eye, and head. The mountain chickadee has the eye mask, but it's got that very strong line above the mask, the white line above that or gray line. So visually, these birds are easy to check apart, to tell apart. But what if you're there and you don't see this bird? All you hear is chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee, or you hear. <whistles> which in winter, when this mountain chickadee is more prevalent at Rio Fernando, he's, that bird is not gonna be making that sound until maybe January once the days start getting longer. So what do you do? You could enter it as the Poseal genus, which is its genus. Let's drop back over there to the big bird list. You could, you could list it as the, um, where are we? Here we go, as, the, as a Poseal We'll see a uh, genus, but since there's only two possibilities at that location, the thing to do is actually to find my way back to wherever we were. <laughs> uh, it's gotta be one of these tabs. Okay, I'll just go there again. Got too many tabs open. Spuds and slashes. If you want to know about genera, about genus, you can look there. Spuds and slashes. And here we are back. And we say, use the black capped slash mountain chickadee to identify this bird. Any other questions at this point? Here's the other thing. Oh, go ahead. Please. So far, no, no questions. You know what? So you enter a check a checklist, and then afterwards you think, you know, oh, that, you know, that is out to lunch. Okay, you delete the checklist. It'll be like it never happened. See, that's one of the principal things of birding. You never know what you missed. You have to choose: do I go that way or do I go that way? But you never know what you missed. You only know what you found. It's a it's a comforting thing sometimes. Robert, can you talk a little bit about um, just the eBird app, uh, smartphone app, and how it works with Merlin? I will. Let's just uh, tell you what let's do. Let's go back over here. 
We'll go back to the eBird. We'll go quick links and we'll go over to the uh, eBird phone app tutorial. I tried to get my phone online here so I could show you, but I couldn't, but uh, I guess we could try just through the, am I sharing my screen? No, not currently, no. Okay, let's, let's just try this for a minute. The eBird app can, let me get to a place where I can see um, everybody seeing. Is there any hope? No, no. it doesn't show up. Oh. Anyway, there is an eBird app and uh, it's very easy to use. You start a checklist and it gives you a place to enter data. You can, you can, uh, here, let, you know what let's do? Let's just do this. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. With eBird Mobile, birding. Okay, let me share my screen. Let's just look, and because this is this is good. When we do workshops with the people that want to be monitors and stuff, we will be going over all of this in detail. But um, let me see if I can share my screen. All right, I'm to just play the part of this. It's never video. been easier. This free mobile app works anywhere in the world, helping you quickly enter checklists while keeping track of your exact birding route, letting you just enjoy the birds. When you first install the app, you'll need to download a pack of information on what birds are expected in your region. Bird packs let you get a precise list of birds for your area, regardless of your internet connection. The app will suggest the best pack based on where you are, and you can download other packs through settings at any time. Now you're ready to start birding. Typically, you'll be entering a checklist in real time, so the app knows the date and time you're starting. I want to record my track, so I'll leave that on. Tracking is a great feature that allows eBird to fill in where you're birding, how far you travel, and how long you're birding for. It keeps track so you don't have to. All right, you're all set. Now click Start Checklist. When you start a checklist, eBird uses your current GPS location and your bird packs to provide a list of expected species that are likely to be in that area at that time of year. You'll fill in this checklist as you go. Once you've found a bird you know, by sight or sound, the fastest way to add it is to type right here in the quick entry bar. Let's start with two mallards out on the pond. Type the number of birds, two, and the species, mallard, then select the species from the checklist, and you're all set. It's that easy. Let's enter a few more settings the same way. There's five Canada geese foraging in the grass. Sounds like there's a red-tailed hawk calling nearby. And there's an osprey eating a fish. And a great blue heron flying overhead. You can see all the birds you've already tallied by switching to the checked view. This is particularly helpful for adding more sightings to a species. For example, you see three more mallards. Tap the number three times and you're all set. You'll notice some birds have these icons next to their names. These show whether a bird is infrequently reported or unreported for that region and time of year. By tapping a species name, you can make changes to your tally or add comments about the bird's field marks, its behavior, the habitat you saw it in, or anything else you find interesting. This is especially important for those rare and unusual sightings. You can see where you've been by clicking here to review your track. When you're finished birding, tap stop. If you have an active track, eBird will ask you if you're done birding. Tap stop track to confirm. Now it's time to review your checklist. The first thing you'll need to do is add your location. The best way to do this is to use the map. 
It's important to choose a location that accurately represents where you were birding. You can either choose an appropriate existing location or create a new location by tapping on the map. In this case, you are birding at Sapsucker Woods, so choose that location. Next is info about your birding outing. This is what makes eBird tracking great. Tracking has already defined your checklist type based on whether you are moving or stationary. Tracking also fills in the duration and distance traveled. You can change your checklist type and edit the other fields if you need to. Before you can submit, eBird asks if you're submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify. Complete checklists are eBird's way of knowing you've identified and reported all of the birds you saw or heard to the best of your ability. It's not possible to detect every single bird. Nobody can do that. As long as you've listed all of the species you could identify, then check yes. You can also enter comments about your birding experience. You can document the weather, other animals you saw, or any other fun memories. Last but not least, you can review the species you reported. When you're ready, click Submit. Congratulations, you're an eBirder. You're now part of the largest birding community in the world. Okay, I think that gives you a, uh, an idea. Now, that guy could type very fast without touching his keyboard, but you can also use the four letter codes in, in, the, in the app as well. So if you wanted to record that great blue heron, it would be great blue is hyphenated, so it'd G, B, H, E, and so forth. Uh, let me show you one last thing and then we'll take a couple of questions and call it quits. Let me share my screen again. Um, in the exercises for today, if you go to the, I call out going to this list, you go to bird lists and you choose the taxonomic list of all species. These, this is the 146 species that we've put on the, the list of regularly seen birds at Rio Fernando. And you get this list. It lists all of the four letter codes, black chinned hummingbird, calliope hummingbird, there are about just where it doesn't follow C-A-G-O and some of those you just have to learn because there are other birds that this would be confused with the cackling goose if it was C-A-G-O. So they use Kang, the first three letters for Canada goose. This list also use in the, home, in the homework, in the exercises, this list will take you, if you click on the name, it takes you to the information page for that species. If you click on the scientific name, it takes you to that same page, but it's within the family. Look on this one, it takes you to the same page, but it's within the seasonal grouping for that species. So it's a, it, to me, it's a very useful page. You can go down, you can, you can see a lot, you see everything that you're likely to see, things you need to learn. And you may find that you know a lot of the birds already on this list. Uh, one thing that I would add in um, as far as the apps go is the Merlin ID app. Um, I find it really, really useful. Um, it, it, um, it just kind of walks you through some different steps to help you identify the bird that you um, that you've seen, and then it connects you with uh, with eBird um, so that you can add that to your checklist automatically. It's it's a really smooth, easy to use system, and um, I I've been playing with the two of them together, and pretty cool. Uh, you know, next next time. Uh, we will we will use Merlin to do an ID. Uh, it, it's quite it's pretty amazing. So it generally does not land you necessarily on the exact bird, but it gives you a few choices, and usually, that the bird you're thinking about 
is on that list. Right. Yeah. You have any any questions before we close it up for the day? So on the, I have the Merlin Bird ID downloaded, mm -hmm. but not the eBird app. So you must have to have both apps downloaded for them to talk to each other. Is that yeah. right? You have to have them both to talk to each other. Right. And on the Mer Merlin Bird ID, I have our area package downloaded, but not mm -hmm. like someone sent me a picture the other day from San Diego. And I was, uh -huh. went, oh, that's a cormorant, but I couldn't get the photo of the cormorant. I couldn't look at it to say which one. And um, so, because I didn't download San Diego's. Uh -huh. is, that, is there a way that you can actually see birds from elsewhere if you don't have the packs downloaded? I not not using that app. Mm -hmm. I think you have to download the 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 uh, packs for that. If you go on to regular eBird eBird.org, you can certainly get there. But but Merlin is only a phone app. Okay, right. And the the other day I was trying it out with some. I had a couple of bird photos on my uh, on my iPhone, and. I thought, well, I'm going to try it out. I tried out Merlin because you can just enter a bird picture on Merlin, and I entered the picture and and you and you make it larger so it fills the screen, and it nailed it every time. And they weren't they weren't telephoto pictures, and I tried it with a drawing of a photo that I had made out of Sibley's, and Sibley evidently got it right too because it went right to the species from the picture. So that's cool. <laughs> Um, someone wants to know: Is iBird Pro still widely used? Is that a good a good um, app? It is. It is widely used. I don't use it, but Jack, who's right there on the screen, we were talking about these various apps. It's widely used. Yes. Uh huh. Another one is Bird's Eye, and that's another one where you can load packs. For, for wherever you're going, if you're going to South America or you're going to Central America or Europe or whatever, you know, since we're all doing so much travel right now, you can download a pack for wherever you're going. You can download a pack for Española or Taos. Well, all right, if, if that's it, um... We'll, we'll start wrapping up. Um, I will have this uh, video a recording of this posted to our website. I sent you the, the link in the chat for the previous two um, workshops. I'll get this one up on that page as soon as I can. And we will have our fourth and final workshop next Monday at 4 p.m. Same Zoom link. Great. That those links, if you go to the web tool, those links are all on the web tool and they're on the RioAndBoodleBirds.org website as well. Thanks, everybody. That was fun. All right. Thanks, guys.